And the way that we do this is by considering that each one of these products is made of a collection of all of these different person bites that different people have. So the first approximation would be to say, well, if we have a country, you know, and that country has lots of knowledge, lots of person bites distributed among its population, that country is probably more likely to be able to make a large number of different products. Now, if you have a product that only requires a few people bites, well, that product probably can be made by many countries. But the opposite would also be true. If you have a product that is very complex, that would require lots of people bites, well, there are very few countries that can make those products. So what you can do is you can say, well, you know, if we have actually you know, a country that is very diverse, make products that few other countries make, and the countries that make what that country makes, make lots of products themselves, then you have a little bit of a better guess that that's a country that has a lot of these little knowledge pieces of these person bites. If a country makes few products that are made by everyone else, and everyone that makes those products tends to also be very little diverse, then you have a better guess that that's a country that has few people bites. So as you can see, you can actually connect this idea of the person bite or the people bite to the structure of the network that connects countries to the products that they make. Because in that network, there is a signature of the amount of people bites that countries have and that products require. So let's see how this looks like. So when we take this into the data, you know, these are what come out as the top five most complex products in the world and the less complex products in the world. So the most complex products in the world are things like you know, instruments and appliances that you're gonna use to do physical or chemical analysis, machines that are, used, uh, in the, uh, that are based on your knowledge of x-rays, you know, machine tools for working metal and so forth. And the least complex products will be things like crude oil, tin ore, cocoa beans, sesame seeds, or raw cotton. And these are you know, products that are a little complex, but remember that we have used no information on income, no information on price, no information on the size of these countries, no information on the size of their economies, only information on the structure of the network of who makes what. Now, we're gonna ask the opposite question. Which are the countries that have more people bites, and which are the countries that have less people bites? And when we do this calculation, we find that Japan, Ichiban, Deitsu, Niban, <laughs> Suisu, Sanban, and Sweden, Yonban. So we find that actually Japan appears to be the number one country in the world, according to this measure. It's the most sophisticated when we look at what it's done and the things that countries make, not at how much they make. Second one is Germany, third one Switzerland, fourth is Sweden. The least complex countries in the world come out to be Papua New Guinea, Congo, Sudan, Angola. So this appears to make lots of sense. But making sense is not what actually makes a scientific theory valid. Because there's a lot of things that make sense. You know, religion sometimes makes a lot of sense, but that doesn't make it science. You know? So we need to have something more. You know? So what we can look is, well, how this compares with other measures, other ways of trying to understand where countries are. So here what I'm gonna show is on the x-axis, we have our measure of how many people bites a country has. And you see like Japan there is number one. And here on the y-axis, we have the income per capita. And you see that there's a relatively decent correlation. Now, these three dots that are here, this is Singapore, this is Chile, and this is Pakistan. And I like to use these three countries to illustrate, you know, because these are three countries that in that year, they exported exactly the same number of products. But when I look at how many countries exported what Singapore exported, and how diversified were those countries, and how many other countries exported what those countries exported, and so forth, Singapore starts grouping with the rich countries. And when I do the same exercise for Pakistan, it groups with the poor countries. So, you know, we have something that correlates with income, but there are many, many things that correlate with income. You know? So the question that I'm gonna ask next is, what does it mean to be down here or up there? 
Well, if you're down here, what it means is that you have what it takes, you have the people bites, you have the knowledge necessary to produce things that are being produced by guys that are 10 times richer than you. So our prediction would be that if you are below the line, you should grow faster than if you're above the line. So if we take the distance to the line, that should predict growth in the future. And it works really, really well. So we can predict growth 20 years in advance extremely accurately. So now we say, well, you know, this is all part of a book that you can actually download for free and you can play with the data for free as well. You know, it's part of our open way of, of, of disseminating the knowledge that we produce. You know? But you can say there are many people that have looked at ways of trying to understand the level of development of countries. So we're going to compare in a few seconds you know, our measure with that of others. So what we're going to do, this is a little bit technical, but we're going to take the whole variance of growth and we're going to see how much our variable measuring people bytes explain and how much do these other variables explain. So here, the red bar is how much you know, our variable of people bytes explains for growth on 12 years. And here we have all the World Bank's variables for institutions. So we find that actually, you know, we explain like sort of like between 500% to 1,000% more, even if we take them all together. Here we take, you know, our variable of knowledge as expressed in the products that you make, and here we take variables of education. And finally, down here, we take the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Index. And once again, you know, there's a very clear difference. We explain much more of future growth than then. Now, uh, every year you're going to see that when the Global Competitiveness Index comes out, there's going to be a page on the news. And it's going to say, uh, your country went up one spot or went down two spots. Okay? That news could very well be rephrased you know, in the future. That news could be, country has a statistically insignificant change in ranking that does not predict anything. So I, I want to conclude by saying that we weren't born into this people by age. You know, we weren't born into this age in which actually there are like large volumes of knowledge and we need to create these large networks of people and organizations to be able to create the things that we have invented, to put them into practice. Many years ago, you know, our great, great, great grand ancestors had a total amount of knowledge that was very similar to the one that each one of them could hold. You know? But knowledge is very leaky. And as people discover stuff, other people imitate or learn from them, and it starts growing. And it starts growing. And at some point, you start hitting a certain natural limit that is not that of the individual, it's not the person bite, but it's the amount of knowledge that you can embed in an organization. You know? So my argument is that actually we are just beyond that limit. So the, the, the key message here is that the structure of society you know, is determined by a variety of things. Yeah? You know, our claim is that in this case, the structure of society is determined by the total amount of knowledge that you have in society. In the past, when you had very little knowledge, you know, what you had was you know, a society in which the best strategy was to keep that knowledge to yourself. You discovered, in, in the age of the caiman, a new way of making a stick very sharp. You know? Well, if you keep that knowledge to yourself, maybe you're going to be the king of the tribe. But as the knowledge keeps on leaking and leaking and leaking, at some point, you're going to get to a limit in which, in order to do something, you're going to need to collaborate with others. So you're going to need to create a team, or you're going to need to create a, like a little organization such that each one of you can specialize in different parts of this knowledge set, and you can make that happen. You know? So then you're going to go into the limit of the organization. And at that limit was a strategy. Well, you have to share with others within your group, but you would not share with someone outside the group. But knowledge is going to still keep on increasing, and it's going to keep on leaking, and then you're going to get you know, to a point in which actually you know, the knowledge that you have is larger than the one that exists you know, or that can be held by your organization. 
and then where you're gonna go into a limit in which actually society gets structured by networks of organizations or networks of firms. You know, because the products simply you know, require a division of knowledge that is larger than the one a single organization, a single vertical integration can hold. You know? So in, in this world, in the world where actually you know, value comes increasingly from these person bites, what are the questions that you need to ask? You know? As an organization, you want to ask, what is your role in that network? Okay? What are you actually missing out because of barriers to interaction? You know? And how are your actions affecting that network as a whole? And if you think about it, we live in a world in which organizations are connected and we have many policies. Some are government policies and some are internal policies that actually you know, protect the nodes. But we have very few policies that protect the links. You know? So these networks sometimes are very hard to form. And the Media Lab is actually an open platform that allows you to create this ecosystem. And is working in this ecosystem at all scales. So I want to finish actually by going a little bit of what you're going to see during the day. You know? Here's the example of Source Map. And Leo Bonani then is going to show you how actually the Media Lab has been creating you know, these tools to be, make supply networks accessible to everyone. Then Kent Larson actually has been rethinking cities, you know, using data and using ways of actually you know, thinking of how cities are going to be in the future and how we should rethink with the changes of technology. They have all been thinking mobility in cities. They have been, uh, and then Joe Paradiso is going to tell us how they have been rethinking smart, intelligent, and responsive environments and buildings. Uh, we go even to like a smaller level in which we're rethinking organizations and Ben Waver is going to show you and going to talk about a technology that allows you to measure the face-to-face -face network that exists within a firm and how that face-to-face -face network affects things from how happy the employees are to how productive they are. And finally, Nathan is going to go to like the deepest level, to the level of the link and is going to show how new technologies are affecting the way that people interact with each other and that people interact with machines. So with that, I would like to conclude, you know, and I want to welcome everyone to the power of open scaling the ecosystem. Because anything that is worth doing cannot be done alone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cesar. Thank you. <laughs>